do you think of yourself as a rational person? Do you make decisions based on well-reasoned arguments and data? Well, if you answered yes to either of those questions, then I'm afraid that I've got some bad news for you. We are not rational beings, none of us. Being rational is extremely hard work. So mostly we make decisions based on habit and jumping to conclusions. So what are some of the common assumptions in software development, the conclusions that we tend to jump to? In this episode, I will unpack some of the received wisdom, the ideas in software that are generally held to be true, and ask you whether on reflection you think they are true or whether they are false. Hi, I'm Dave Farley of Continuous Delivery. Welcome to my channel. If you haven't already, please do hit subscribe. And if you enjoy the video, hit like too. In this episode, I want to explore some of the assumptions that are common to software development. What's the things that we commonly get wrong? And what are the, what's the wisdom that we commonly rely on? We think of ourselves as rational beings, but we aren't. If you want to get people to agree with you in a meeting, what's the most important thing for you to do? Bring data, perhaps. Make a great case. Create a great presentation to win people over with the power of your argument, maybe. Or wear a nice suit. Well, none of these things seem to matter very much. Psychologists say that the most influential thing that you can do to get people to agree with you is to bring nice food. Better snacks wins the argument. We are apes, developed chimpanzees, and our biology takes precedence over us. There's more. Neuroscientists have identified two different ways in which we think. System one and system two. Let me demonstrate. Here is a calculation. Here is another. My bet is that you had two completely different reactions to these two calculations. In the first case, your brain produced the answer before you even consciously registered that the, what the question was on the screen. It just came to the forefront of your mind. Two plus two equals four. In the second, my bet is that you did something very different indeed. Your brain probably went something like this. Uh, Dave's just put numbers on the screen. Um, do I know the answer to this one? Mm, no. Can I be bothered to work it out? Mm, no. I'll wait and see if he tells me the answer. The first is an example of what neuroscientists call system one thinking. This is the kind of firmware of your brain. It can respond really quickly in around 14 milliseconds, but it works by guessing the answers, based only on instinct and previous repeated experience. The second calculation, engage system two. This is your conscious mind at work. It's slow deliberate. It takes about 200 milliseconds for your consciousness even to begin working on something. This is the only place where rational thought can take place. If you put someone in an fMRI scanner while they're doing system one or system two thinking, you can see the difference. System one engages a small part of our brains. System two lights our brains up like a firework show. System two literally burns more calories than system one. So guess what? We have evolved, we are programmed to prefer using system one. It loses less energy. So we'd rather jump to conclusions than to think rationally. That's not an option. That's the way that our brains work. In order to work rationally, we need to work really hard. It doesn't come easily to us. So mostly, we aren't rational. Let's play a little game. Let's look at a few assumptions that most of us make and test them out. Please do add your thoughts and answers in the comments section below. True or false, the choice of programming language matters. If I'm honest, my guess was false, but the data is against me. 
but it's still interesting. Experiments are debatable, as ever, uh, and the ones that I've read tend to use some measures that we would all agree aren't ideal, but they are measures that are easy to apply to software. So they tend to use things like lines of code or function points. In this case, the experiments that I'm referring to here used function points, a measure probably a little bit old fashioned these days of the number of features, functions within the software that we are creating. This is an imperfect measure, but probably as good as we're likely to get to understand something and to compare different projects from different teams doing different things. So what do you think? Which language is going to win? Which one is going to be the most efficient at creating the largest number of function points? It's bound to be one of the new sexy languages, right? Maybe one of the new functional languages that is likely to win. Well, no. The results of a 2017 study say that the most efficient language is small talk. I'm imagining all of the old small talk programmers laughing behind their hands in the back row right now. Next most successful language is Eiffel. It's a good job that we all program in small talk and Eiffel, Eiffel then. In the top 25 languages, C comes last, it comes 25th. JavaScript comes 23rd. Slightly better than Fortran, but worse than 4th or C++ in the rate at which it can create features. Haskell and Erlang are top of what I'd think of as contemporary languages in, in use, if not common use, uh, th these days. With Ruby, F-sharp, C-sharp, Dart and Python and Java firmly mid-table. I think that there are plenty of caveats about this research. I'm still convinced that design will say more about productivity and quality than language, but that is just another of my biases. I have no data for that assertion, only my own subjectivity. It makes you think, doesn't it, when you start looking at things that we can measure. True or false, our project is going slowly, so we should add more people. I think that most of the people that are likely to be watching this channel are going to assume that that's false. And of course I would agree. And that is backed up by the data. My favourite data for, uh, for this comes from a study of over 4,000 projects. In it, they used another overly simplistic measure, in this case lines of code. They divided the projects into two different groups. Teams with five and fewer people, and teams with 20 or more. Then they looked at the commit history for those projects to see who first got to 100,000 lines of code. Who do you think won? The teams of five or fewer, or the teams of 20 and more? Well, it was the teams of 20 or more that won the race. But, on average, they got to 100,000 lines of code a week ahead of the five-person teams. On average, for all the teams, it took nine months. So over a nine month period, a team of 20 people only beat a team of five people by one week. So person for person, a team of five is almost four times as productive as a team of 20. Then if we look at the quality by counting defects, the five person teams produced five times fewer defects than the 20 person teams. This one plays a bit more firmly to my prejudices, if I'm honest. You don't go faster by adding people. And there is a very hard limit, a severe limit, on how many people we can safely add. 20 people is way too many. There's other data from other research that says that the sweet spot is probably around project teams of eight or fewer, and that's where we should focus. Eight people or fewer are, are efficient, they can communicate quickly and effectively, and so produce, produce better outputs. So if we want to do something bigger, we divide the, uh, our teams up into smaller groups of eight or fewer people. Next, true or false? We don't have time to test, refactor, tidy up or create nice designs. 
False, 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 false. Software development is a marathon, not a sprint. We need to optimize to be efficient, sure, but that means we need to be efficient over a long period of time. We need to be sustainably efficient, not just efficient over a week or two. As the quality of our system reduces, our ability to change it reduces too. As our quality reduces, the amount of time that we spend fixing bug goes up too. Test-driven development, continuous integration, continuous delivery result in orders of magnitude reductions in the number of defects in production. Imagine spending a hundred times less time on bug fixing, analysing production failures to figure out what went wrong, or on triage meetings to decide which bugs to fix and which ones to leave. The numbers say that teams that practice continuous delivery spend 44% more of their time on the new features, and this is one of the reasons why they spend less time doing wasteful, nasty work fixing bugs that don't exist, don't get introduced at the same rate. Continuous delivery and in particular test room development are kind of weird though. As a developer, even one that believes in these practices like me, all of that time spent on writing tests and getting your continuous delivery processes working does feel kind of costly, but it's not. This is the most, this is an illusion. Continuous delivery is the most efficient way that we know to produce software, and we can measure that. So if your organization has deadlines to meet, then continuous delivery is more important, not less. True or false? Technical excellence and coding skills are the most important attributes of a good programmer. First, my subjective impressions. Good people make a difference. Technical skills are part of what makes a good programmer good, but not all of what makes a good programmer good. In fact, technical skills matter less than how people work and how they work together. This, I am pleased to say, is backed up by quite a few studies. Google did some interesting research into what makes a perfect team. They studied over 180 teams over a period of more than two years to find out what made a team high performers. I think that lots of us, if asked that question, would respond, well, we need to select smart, skilled, dedicated people. We'll pick the A players. I think that when Google did their research, they expected to find answers rather like this set of people with these skills plus these other people with these other skills working like this is the best. Instead, what they found was something else entirely. Who is on the team matters less than how the team members interact, structure their work and view their contributions. They found that the number one predictor of team success was the psychological safety of its members. The degree to which team members trusted one another and relied on, on each other for help. There was some other research that I read about quite a few years ago now that I always found interesting. The researchers wanted to find out what made great programmers great. They studied a lot of people who other people recommended to them who, and thought that they were great programmers. Again, assuming that they'd find skills like deep technical skills or great design skills or this particular range of experience. Instead, what they found was that as far as they could see, there was only one shared characteristic between these great programmers. Great programmers talked to other people substantially more than average programmers. Software development is a human discipline. Despite the cultural caricature of the technical nerd that I'm sure many of us identify with to some degree, those aren't the best developers. The best developers share ideas, bounce them around, collaborate, argue, debate, and are good at working as part of a team. Finally, true or false, there is no silver bullet, language, techn technology or process that will guarantee you success. Well, true, obviously true, there are no guarantees. However, I do think that we tend to throw the baby out with the bathwater on this one. Just because there are no guarantees of success 
doesn't mean that there aren't ways to stack the odds in our favour. I believe that we can make a substantial difference to our chances of success by trying to overcome our physiological and neurological limitations. We can apply a bit more science. We can expend the extra calories that it takes to make important decisions a bit more rationally. And when we do, we get quite significantly better results. In a famous paper many years ago, deep thinker on software development Fred Brooks said, there's no silver bullet. There is no process or technology that will give a 10x improvement in quality or productivity. And I think he was probably right. But I think that there are lots of processes and technologies that will reduce performance by at least 10 times. So if you are world class across the board, then I'm afraid that there is no 10x for you. But if you are not yet world class everywhere, well, there may be. All ideas are not equal. Some are just bad ideas. If we could just improve at reducing our dependence on these bad ideas, maybe by spending a few more calories in our brains, we could significantly improve our chances of doing a better job. Thank you very much for watching.